First is, is uh, Dan Chappelle. He's a registered forester. He does forest inventory and analysis of the Alabama Forestry Commission. Um, he serves as the coordinator of the Alabama Forestry Commission's Forestry Inventory and Analysis Program. We oversee the field of a staff of six to collect data from over 5,600 plus established plots across the state on, on a seven year cycle. He is a 2002 graduate of the University of Georgia's Warnell School of Forest Resources. Another which will be on the panel is an old buddy of mine, uh, Gary Faulkner. Uh, he'll be up here in just a second, too. Uh, Gary serves as the Forest Economic Development Specialist for the Alabama Forestry Commission. Uh, Gary retired uh, with the state of Alabama with the Alabama Department of Commerce in 2014. Uh, he had held a position with the Alabama International Trade Center as an International Trade Specialist. And he, his professional state career with the Alabama Forest Com Commission began uh, just, just recently. Well, a few years. He's been there about 100,000 years. <laughs> so, but anyway, Gary and Sandy have one son. I had to say his name is Forrest. He starts to school this fall. So without any further to do, then y'all come right ahead. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's a great uh, privilege to be here. Uh, I know uh, pretty soon you're going to start smelling lunch, and that's when we've got to uh, keep moving. Y'all get moving. I work for Alabama Forestry Commission. Uh, Mr. Rick Oates is our state forester, about 225 employees. We do quite a bit of work, uh, not just fire control. Forest inventory analysis is what I, the pro uh, project I do. We're very proud of the work we do with that. Uh, there's our mission statement, but I'll keep moving. <coughs> Southern forest timber production. The South is the most important wood producing region in the United States of America. You probably know that. Uh, the South produces more than 60% of our nation's industrial roundwood, about 15% of the world's industrial roundwood. And if the South was its own country, I guess it was for a time, um, <laughs> we would produce any more, more industrial roundwood than any other country outside the United States. And the, our relative importance vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world has only been going up in the last 40 years. As things like uh, you know, British Columbia is having trouble right now with mountain pine beetle, and you know, Canada has trouble, and our trees grow fast here. And uh, we also have an advantage, almost all of our timber comes from private land, which is why you're here today. Meeting the challenges of the past, I, I, I know uh, one of the earlier presentations talked about history, and I you know, buck for history too. The statement comes from 1946, just after the end of the war, from the Chief of the Forest Service. This the South has been optimistic about its timber future. You know, that's the future we're living in now. But for a South as a whole, 20 years or more of the present cut on the prevailing practice would mean a reduction of one-third in volume saw timber growing stuff. And you can see. At that time, after the war was over, production was running as fast as possible, and we were consuming the wood faster than it was growing. That was a problem. That's why we have professional foresters. We address that. The timber is a long-term challenge. Here's a statement from 1986. Our former state forester, Mr. Moody. Why am I alarmed? You may be surprised to learn from this 1986. We're cutting more pine trees in Alabama than we are growing. And we're approaching the time when we'll be cutting more hardwoods than we grow as well. And you like the exclamation point. What will happen when our forests can no longer meet the demands of this important industry which generates wealth, provides jobs, provides taxes? With your help and support, we can respond to the challenge before us so that future generations can inherit a strong and viable state which will meet their needs not only for forest products but jobs, taxes, which will help address those other social crises which will surely develop. Again, we're living in the future that Mr. Moody was talking about then. This was a long-term challenge it was a potential for timber fan, not that long ago. Well, now we're in the, living in the future, and the future is different than any of these than the past has been. We're now gaining timber volume in Alabama. Not only are we gaining it, it's sustainable. This is from IFIA data. We're gaining the timber at a higher rate than our sister states. Between 2001 and the and the, the most recent survey, 2017. We're up in timber volume, just you know, fiber volume, about 31 percent. 
you know, South Carolina up 26 percent, Georgia up about 20 percent, uh, Tennessee up a little less than that. Mississippi didn't have their data. Um, that's, that's their fault. You got, you got to get on the stick and you got to get out there and collect it. And they uh, they snoozed there for a while, but they're back in it now. Another way I have of looking at this, let's look at how we're increasing volume in an interest rate kind of a way. About 1.7% per year. So all the trees we got out there right now, all the fiber volume, 365 days we'll have about 1.7% more. That's over and above what dies, over and above what's harvested. We are gaining timber. And then this comes up when you're talking about markets. Well, we've got positive growth over draining out Yes, we do. So does Tennessee, Vermont, Virginia, South. We all do. Growth over drain in the southeast is positive. And Alabama, as positive as anybody. Mississippi accepted. They're growing it a little bit. Well, actually, I'd say they're, they're processing it a little slower than we are. Growing about the same rate. Renewable resource opportunities for this economic development. Again, there's about 23 million acres of forest in the state. You think about, well, those, those western states are so big, but we've got more timberland. We've got more good land here. Uh, Georgia's got about 24 million acres, which are a little bigger than us. And Oregon, about 23 and a half million. Alabama, we have the second largest private timberland acre. Again, Georgia's just a little bit bigger. 89% uh, owned by the non-industrial private land. That's us. About 4% by industrial private landers. That keeps going down as the industry sells off land. They don't have a whole lot left. Uh, it's not in the TMOs, the REITs, and the, in our private hands. We've got an abundance of high quality timber and we're growing it faster than we're using it. I know that's a problem. That's an opportunity. That's what Gary's going to get into. Family Forest, I find this fascinating. I wish this was a little more recent. 2006 numbers. But about 399,000 family forest members. Like, uh, I guess you guys are the tip of the spear because you're in here trying to learn as much as you can. And that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, and then for scale, you kind of see where you where, uh, you sit in the sit in here. Less than 10 less than 10 acres. About 220,000. That's so more than half of folks own just a little bit. Uh, not, all, not hardly enough to manage. But then you get up to the 10 to 50 acres, 121,000 folks, and then it keeps narrowing down. Um, about 16,000 folks have that 1 to 200 acres, and 9,000, you're getting up to 500 acres, and just a handful of folks own real big timber, but of course they are important. Uh, the non private family forest owners, about 28%. Is the TMOs and the REITs and your national forest and the military installations and state parks like we're at about 6%. Look at this chart. This is fascinating. This is, you may think in tons. I'm sorry the FIA thinks in cubic feet, but the graph would be the same. This is just total volume of standing timber going back to 1972. And you can see it's been going up and then it started, that curve just keeps getting steeper. We're at about 40.3 billion cubic feet of standing timber. That's more than we've ever had. And if we were to do this talk next year, probably about 1.7% more than that. So we have a lot of standing timber in our forest. Now how would these growth to drain ratios, I know this is, this is what we're concerned about, we have too much. Well, I don't know if you got too much of a good thing, but our softwood usage, this is our pine timber, you can see the, the we're growing more and the drain, oh, about equal. Industry is doing what it's doing. Hopefully things are picking up. Gary's going to get into that. But as we're growing more and using the same, that means our growth to drain becomes more positive, about almost 1.7 to 1 in 2017. That's for our pine. And this is, um, you may be familiar with this on your own land. I had to illustrate this. This is, if you're from uh, more South Alabama, this is what you've got. The nature of the, what the stand composition, big picture wise, is changing. This is age over Southern <laughs> County region, plantation, lob lolly, long leaf and slash. First graph is the year 2000, second graph is the year 2016. 
<coughs> look at these ages. Look how you've got just back to 2000, and that's not that far back. A lot of young stuff, oh, up to about, you know, 25 years old, most of it was cut, and then you a little bit of old stuff left over. We'll look at it now. Folks sit back in the timber, price it what they want, or they just don't like the look of a clear cut, and we just hold on to it. And look at that age just shift on out there. People are holding on to it longer. The woods are getting older. The bigger trees put on more volume. So the more we don't cut, the more volume we have. And the more we have, the more we get. And uh, fascinating. Anyway, that's a little bit of the, of the type of data we were able to collect from our FIA work. Hardwoods, um, obviously a concern. Growth going up. And... Uh, I'm not going to use that, that, that C word, that uh, Cortland word, but you can see the effect of, of a mill that size shutting down and the entire hardwood usage is, you know, if that's the only thing that changed, and it changed in a negative direction and it shows up in the data. So growth to drain better than two to one. Again, a sucker for history. Um, Back in 1909, that was the peak of that timber boom. You're looking at about, you can't read that probably, but there were 600 sawmills in Alabama. About 600. They were everywhere. But they tended to be small. Um, if you took all 600 of those sawmills, they equaled about the production of two and a half of our modern mills. So yes, they were very small. They had to be local because transport was so difficult. Um, Loblolly at the time was considered the inferior pine species. We had so much quality long leaf that that was, a, that was the good tree and Loblolly was, was a waste of your time. So you see how things change. Timber products output quickly. We're working on a survey right now. We're surveying all the primary uh, wood using mills in the state. If you have an owner mill, we're not going to show you data. It's all aggregated. Uh, we're in the midst of this right now. And uh, we learned that pulpwood, about 54% of the Alabama uh, usage, saw logs about 31%, things like veneer and all to make up the rest. And another graph, you can kind of see the effect of just, well, when the economy went sour, you can see 2009 softwood just fell off a, fell off a cliff there. But, Positive news, 11, 13, and 15, you can see that positive upward trend. We're back in the, we're back in the uh, sawmill business in the, in the state. Hardwoods, well, they kind of do what hardwoods do. They're about level. But uh, if you live in the pine part of the world, things are looking pretty good. Another graph real quick, pulpwood, saw logs, and like I said, some of the, what makes up the rest of it, the panels, the veneer, bioenergy a little bit. And mill residues, this is a, becoming a very big thing as the saw mills ramp up. We've got more residuals than we've, than we've ever had, and we have to find outlets for that. Um, working on that. 348 million cubic feet of sawdust and bark, that's quite a bit, and uh, increasing. Uh, TPO, another thing we learned, and uh, this is a, a fact the state can be proud of, about 85% of the timber we harvest in Alabama, we process it right here in <coughs> Alabama, the value-added part of the chain. So that's where the money's made. And in terms of our neighboring states, you know, Tennessee, Mississippi, Georgia, Florida, we bring in more from our neighbors than we send out. You know, the mills on the on, just on the Georgia side or Mississippi side. We, we, we win that tug of war. Alabama does more value-added processing from out-of-state wood than we send out. And I'm going to pass it over to Gary. I was introduced a little earlier, kind of being around a long time. I kind of feel like that chronic waste disease, I think. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hang in there, but I'm not moving as, as quick as I used to. But I have uh, I've been involved in economic development. We've heard a lot about growth over grain. We've heard a lot about why we've heard a lot about resources and inventory, but there is a demand side to this. I'll just say a show. How many of you would like to see a new mill in your area where your timber is located? I can't imagine. Well, how does that work? How do we go about that? Our company's looking in Alabama. I'm going to give you a little bit of overview of kind of where our state is. 
and a little bit about kind of how that works. How many of you have heard about this little company called Toyota Mazda? That's located in <coughs> quite a bit of it. That doesn't happen overnight. That happens over a period of time. All economic development, including forced products, happens with a reason, with a purpose, with a design. There's a lot of methodology, there's a lot of work, there's a, comp a lot of confidentiality that goes about this. If we, we had a, a professional colleague of ours said, look at the growth of a drain in the south, throw a dart up there. I mean, you're seeing a lot of growth over drain. There's a lot of sweet spots out there too. But once you have that force resource opportunity, then the infrastructure and everything comes to play to make that a good business decision and a good business plan. But, okay, let's talk about the tim timber influence now. Then. I think it's good to revisit this a little bit. We put together some numbers just to kind of give you, uh, uh, you look at just the direct number of employees from the Department of Labor, you know, 40, 41,000 individuals in the state of Alabama is employed by the forest product sector. Uh, and in those earnings, $2.1 billion. This is a huge industry for the state of Alabama. Look at these products, and this is a new number by the Forest Product Development Center, $16.3 billion in shipments annually. Again, in terms of industrial management, in terms of a manufacturing sector, this is large in the state of Alabama. Look at our exports. I was mentioned a little bit earlier today. These are up a bit, but this year the 2017 numbers are $1.45 billion in export. And that was a little bit over what it was for last year. So we have a very good export. And these are Alabama exports. It's not coming from the region. These are state of Alabama exports. In terms of establishments, I talked to the Department of Revenue who also know where all the individuals are employed and they have over 788 forest industry establishments located in the state. That's a good thing. We have a great industry, a vibrant industry. I put there's like 20 different products. How many went to the Brown Foreman? Uh, now that was great. Well, whiskey is probably going to be good that they gave us, but that's that's another story. That was that's a typical classical case of economic development recruitment, vertically integrated. They mentioned that yesterday in the tour. They had the sawmill location, which Commerce and the team of economic development was involved in, locating that over in Stevenson, Alabama, and then the added value vertical integration of the barrel operation. That is exactly what we're looking for in Alabama. So if we recruit the secondary, they're going to feed off the primary. So this is a vertical integration of our industry. And you look at these are just a small amount of products that are produced uh, you know, here in Alabama. But if you look at our ranking, we're very significant if you look at in the United States. And these are up a little bit. Second pulp, a second paper, paper board, six in lumber and wood panel. That was eight. And we have come up in the panel board and in the lumber opportunity. So we're very significant. We are on the map for industrial candidates and those that are looking and to expand here in the state of Alabama. This, now this could be complicated and it's meant to be that, so that's kind of the way I feel in the mornings when I wake up. If you look at this map in the state of Alabama and look at the rural development that our state offers. Now this came, this is the latest map that I know of that shows the locations of loggers, primary, secondary uh, industry in the state of Alabama. So you can see here the interstates are going north and south. And you can see the influx of all these different mills in the state of Alabama. What's, what's the purple or the green? You can't, like we can't see what, yes. what is what. Yes, you see here, this is the outline of the state of Alabama. Right. And if these are loggers, on this insignia right here, the loggers or logging establishments, this Department of Labor would have that. And if you look at the uh, purple here, and that purple, uh, the paper is uh, the brown symbol that you see here, and the purple are secondary and some prim primary mills. And I wish that was clear, but it's hard to get, you know, with the density that we have in the state of Alabama, which is a good thing, it's hard to get. So I, I got that map to show, let me impress myself to see where are our operations, and there's a lot of operations in the state, and it's fully integrated, it feeds off each other. So when you hear about rural development, it is for its products. Now, what are the drivers of our industry? What are we looking at? We're, we're kind of in the middle of this. If you look at housing starts, what are they doing right now? They've been increasing. I don't know if we've got to the maximum or, or we stability with those housing starts, but they have increased. We'll see a little bit of a chart about that. U.S. dollar value is doing well. Of course, if it gets high, it hurt, could hurt our, our exports. Our exports are doing very well right now. 
gross domestic, uh, gross, gross domestic product. That's been doing pretty well. I think the last quarter, 2017, it got around 3 3%, but I think it's in the high twos right now. Capacity utilization, we're seeing much greater percentage in capacity yield. Mortgage rates are going up a little bit. Don't know how that's going to affect housing rates. But all of these different factors and others do affect our forest product industry. All right, we talked about, this is another, don't let this, but look, you know, I call it the great, uh, you know, recession or depression that we had. Uh, we all remember that. Look at these housing starts and what happened <laughs> that, and how that affected our forest product industry. But look at this gradual, gradual climb here. I don't think we're there, there yet on the housing start. And that's going to affect our forest product industry. But you can see these different recessions, how they occur. But you can see how we're in the middle now of this particular. And this has been going, and we'll see some charts here for the next uh, last couple of years. This is what I wanted. Good, this is a good news story. This is a graph that shows from 2007 to, to 2016. And the 2017 report just came out yesterday. And I stayed up a little bit last night to look at some of those numbers. But you can see the steady increase of total capital investment to 2016. It was one, uh, roughly $1.2 billion, 1,000 new jobs created, and 50 projects primary and secondary in the state of Alabama. Interesting to note that 96% of those announcements were from existing industry expansions. Your existing industry is going to expand quicker and sooner because they're already established, already making money, than the new. All right, what does 2017 hold for us? I looked at the numbers last night. I'm an Auburn graduate, so my counting might not be totally great. But it was in the late 40s, about 48, 49 projects. And I think we surpassed the 1.1 or almost 1.2 billion again. We had, we had a great year last year. We had a great year in 2016. How long is this going to continue? We're going to look at this a little bit in 2018, but it started out very well for us. So is our industry doing well? Yes, it's doing very well. And looking at 2016, looking at these expansions and the new, we plotted out on GIS where the uh, the new industries are, which is very important. Every company was new at one point in time, so you need to build on that base. All right, you look across the state, and you can see all where this is all across the state of Alabama, pretty much. And that was one year. We're going to begin uh, keeping that data and. Um, layering that data so we can maybe see some, some trends or some clusters for us. We think we're going to have further opportunities in secondary manufacturing as well. Now, if you look at, again, 2016, some of the notable announcements that we saw in 2016, uh, Chrono expanded, uh, and that, that was huge, $362 million non-structural, GP, $150 million paperboard, Warehouser, of course, Lumber, Millport, Two Rivers Lumber, uh, Lumber, that was new, 55 jobs, 60 million. And there's a fiber uh, operation down in uh, Mobile that expanded that was large. Like 2017, this is very good right here. Uh, cross, how many of you have heard of cross laminated beams? This is a new product, a great product. As a matter of fact, as many of you may know, in Huntsville, we had the first hotel made of, of CLT in the United States. Uh, and it's open, it's, uh, what is the name of that hotel, Comfort? Uh, Candlewood. Candlewood, Candlewood Hotel. And it's a four-story hotel. This is a new product, and we now have a manufacturer here in the state of Allen. That's huge. GP, with their lumber mill, $100 million there in Talladega. IP, this is massive. That's a reinvestment, pulp paper operations, half a billion dollars. That, although we're not going to see jobs created there, that's stability in that particular operation. We've all heard about Corbin. This is a reinvestment in an operation, which is, which is very good news. And then James Hardy, part, many of you probably have your homes with, with that particular product, and they've located in Prattville, Alabama. 2018, well, it kind of keeps continuing. you got Rex Lumber down in Troy, Alabama, $110 million. Kimberly Clark just announced $100 million. So we're seeing a large operation. It is continuing. It is good news. It is wonderful economic development. Kim Mullenfeld at the Alabama, uh, it was the fourth product development center with AID Team and Commerce. This is his chart. Uh, of course, he has a disclaimer. The above represents the sole opinion of the author. He's pretty good. So I kind of have confidence in what he does. 
and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll talk about him a little bit, but he was looking at each of these forest industry uh, sectors, near-term, mid-term, long-term, and looking at different facets of, of trends in the market. And he emphasized kind of the strong market. We are seeing that in Alabama already uh, in the lumber. We're seeing it already in the near term. We're seeing OSB expansions and restarts uh, here in the state of Alabama. So I would, I would almost say that moderate to strong. Uh, we're seeing non-structural. We had seen that already in engineered wood products. We had seen that. And we're seeing secondary wood products as well. So this might be his opinion, but I think this is kind of following suit. And this is a good spectrum for primary and secondary. You really need both to uh, facilitate each other. Well, where are these guys going to locate? You all want them near your, your, your timberlands or, or so operations because it's about job creation, but it's also about timber and having markets <coughs> for your timber. I thought I'd put this up here uh, in industrial recruitment, in economic development, it's this mystical world. You'll see these headlines, but there's a lot of work that goes on behind it. Where do they find these buildings or sites? Well, the state of Alabama, we have all these sites on one database, and it's edpa.org, Economic Development Partnership of Alabama. And if you look, and I took the latest numbers, uh, well, let me get back, number of buildings that we have right now uh, that are available are 361 buildings in Alabama. You can go to this website and look at details of those buildings. Uh, photographs, square footage is, what the infrastructure is. We also show uh, the sites that are available, and 58 of those are advantage sites. You would say shovel ready, they're not shovel ready, but they're at much advantage. 532 sites. We have plenty of sites available in the state of Alabama for expansion. All right, well, how do we go about that? What is our strategy? Do we have a strategy in Alabama for what are uh, initiatives for industrial recruitment, for the demand side? We're very fortunate in this state that we have at least five different initiatives. The first is Alabama Department of Commerce. Uh, they have an initiative Accelerate Alabama, which is their strategy, and Forest Products is one of the seven targeted markets. It is working very well for the state of Alabama. That is an emphasis for us. We have a gentleman with the Department of Commerce, and you'd like to know that he spends every day, every waking moment, with recruitment for Forest Products. It's good to know that we have someone on our team in the state of Alabama that that's what he does exclusively, and he is very, very good at it. Next, Alabama Forestry Commission. We could not recruit industry, particularly primary, without the FIA data. So we constantly have the FIA data to show us where our sweet spots are predicated on what the forest product company is looking for. And so once we find those resource areas, then our work goes in finding the site to see if they're compatible for a location. And of course we have the TPO, the Timber Product Output Study, that we actually go to every primary mill to collect data for uh, utilization. Workforce, we're going to see how that's important. Workforce is huge. Alabama's unemployment rate might be dipping below 3% now, around 4%. That's full employment. Where are these companies going to get their workforce, be it forest products, be it automotive, we have got, we've done a great job in industrial recruitment, great job in industrial <coughs> development, but at the end of the day, assets are your people and people are your assets. You have to have people at these manufacturing plants. Every state has that opportunity and that particular problem. In Alabama, we've got uh, Alabama Forestry Foundations come up with Forestry Works, and that is working very well for us to designate and certify and to draw interest with those that be interested in working in the forest product industry. We have the Forest Products Development Center with Ken Mielenfeld under the Alabama Department of Commerce that does recruitment as well for us. And then, of course, now we have the Alabama Wood Innovation Team. And that's going to be a public-private group that is looking to increase the value and opportunity for demand uh, in Alabama. Well, how, what do the executives look for? These are, uh, it's a top 25 list, but these are top 10 lists of really what corporate executives, be a forest product or not a forest product, look for. Look at the top few. These don't change too much. Highway, labor costs, labor availability. We talked about labor. That's labor workforce development. That is labor. Quality of life. Every community said we've got the best community in the world, but how do you prove that? Uh, security and law enforcement is, is the top in quality of life. That's a separate list. Tax incentives. Uh, you know, proximity to major markets. Once you know you have that forest resource, once you have a project, here's a fictitious project code name Yellowhammer just made that up and they'll have project code names. They'll be very secretive. You'll never know they're looking. 
project yellow hammer, you have to fulfill that wood uh, fiber requirement first, and then you have the site location parameters. Once you have those, you may have to fill out and complete a request for information or request for a proposal. All of this takes time, a lot of work, and, and then you're competing. It's all about competition. You may be competing with two or three or four other states or another country. Totally. And then hopefully we'll come out on a successful announcement in Alabama. What are the top 10 states for doing business? 2017, Area Development Magazine, Alabama's number six. Now, this is in the nation. We're doing very, very well in the state of Alabama. We're competing very, very well for economic development and recruitment. All right? If you look at uh, business climate rankings, my gosh, we're in the top 10 again. We're doing something right here in the state of Alabama, and it has to do with our political process of doing great environmental permitting, infrastructure, uh, providing a team that, that works well with economic development. We do a very good job in this state for this. So in summary, we'll just take the big points. Uh, if you were a client you were looking to locate in the state of Alabama, we have abundant resources. And we uh, can obviously look in detail where those resources are, positive put the growth to, to drain inventory. We have a very significant industry. We have a variety of industry that can multiply itself in the secondary and the primary. And we have a, a very rural impact, of course. We have a tremendous amount of statewide contributions. We have a priority for economic development for portion industries in the state of Alabama. And we have a very positive uh, business climate. The outlook is very positive and optimistic for Alabama for forest products. Now, we've been doing very well in the state of Alabama. I think I like to use the phrase, we strike fear in the heart of our competitors, because when Alabama is involved in an economic development project, they know we're very, very serious and we're there to win. And it, it's a tough business. Uh, it's a very competitive business. Uh, economic development just doesn't happen overnight, and we've got great layers of economic developers locally, state, regional, uh, that do a tremendous job for us in the state of Alabama. And that's all I have to say, because I'm right before lunch, and I'm not going to hold you up. <laughs> yes, sir.